This is the question that we've asked for now three weeks at Nona Church. Who needs God? And it is the question that as a society we find ourselves asking with greater intensity and with greater frustration because on the individual level and on the collective level, our feelings of actual need for God are becoming less and less and less. And wherever you are this morning, in terms of your relationship with God, if you're all in or you're totally not in, I want you to know you're welcome here. You're welcome in this conversation this morning. Some of us here, we believe in God, but we still wonder. Some of us wonder how anyone how anyone could believe in God or religion or faith or Christianity. And some of us wonder if we could believe again. Nona Church, this is a place where you can belong before you believe, and it's a place where you can honestly bring your doubts, your frustrations, your pain, and your anger, your questions, bring them all out in the open. It's all welcome here. As Colin has said, uh, this Series is actually really just one long mega sermon broken up over multiple weeks. And so if you haven't heard the past two, I encourage you this afternoon, jump on our website and listen to them. But let me catch you up real quick, give you a recap of where we've been and now where we are. In part one, we learned that in asking the question, who needs God? And in stepping away from him, rejecting, abandoning, even denying God and his existence, when we step away from him, we step towards something else, atheism. And when we really, really look at atheism, what it is and where it leads us, the logical conclusions of believing that there is no God, the results of what we find actually aren't quite as satisfying and aren't quite as hopeful and aren't quite what we thought they would be. And then in part two, we looked at the experience of in walking away from God, perhaps the God with a little g that you walked away from was not actually the God of the Bible. And so the God that you walked away from was definitely a God actually worth leaving because he isn't the God of the Bible. And so now we're here at part three, investigating the spark that so often lights our doubts and our angers and our fears aflame to cause us to walk away from God. And that problem is simply this, justice. The problem that causes so many of us to walk away from God in anger or in deep, deep sadness and fear is justice. A justice is simply this, it is things made right. And we all long for a just world in which everything is right, a world in which every person and every people is treated honorably, with respect, treated equitably. And yet that desire really is just a desire. It's a dream because that's not the world we live in. We don't live in a world like that. We don't even live in a world close to like that. And so whether it was hearing somebody else's story of injustice, like Elena or Andre or Chicha, or it was through experiencing the suffering of your own life and the injustice that you have walked through or the people that you dearly, dearly loved have walked through, We all face this problem of reconciling the innumerable injustices in the world with a God who is supposedly just. And out of these two things coming into contact and the dissonance and the disconnect that happens there, we walk away. Because either God can't make things right or he won't make things right, or maybe he's not even there. He wasn't even in existence in the first place to do anything about it. This is what atheism would tell us, that there is no God, which is why there is evil and injustice in the world. But the problem here is that when we remove God from the scenario, we actually also remove good and evil, justice and injustice 
as well. Because if there is no God, there is no justice. If you're taking notes, this is a great place to start. If there is no God, there is no justice. We simply cannot have it both ways. Either there is a God who provides universally true definitions of what is right and wrong, good and evil. And then in that framework, there is actual injustice and evil to be angry and hurt and broken about. Or there is no God and therefore no universally true definitions of what is right and wrong, good and evil, only cause and effect, chance and happenstance, ethically neutral outcomes that tend to favor the strong and the advantaged. So that on the individual level, good is merely what you like. Good is what you prefer. And evil is what you don't like. Evil is what you don't prefer. And so then when your definition of good and evil and your definition of good and evil are not the same, there is conflict. So multiply that by 7 billion and you have a good picture of the world. 7 billion people with their own personal definitions of what is good and evil, right and wrong. And then they don't all agree with each other. And then you get arguments and conflicts and fights and eventually war. And yet, even then, if this is true, We cannot objectively call anything that happens, even in war, good or evil. Because those terms are just language that we apply individually to our personal preferences. And so we might as well exchange those two words for each other, calling good and evil, evil and good, because they're simply just words. And that's it. This is not a mischaracterization of atheism. Let me show you. Richard Dawkins explains the atheistic option this way. In a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt and other people are going to get lucky. And you won't find any rhyme or reason to it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect. If there is at the bottom no design No purpose, no evil, and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. If this is true, if this is true, then why do our hearts break when the defenseless are exploited? I mean, why does our anger boil over when thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people are killed because of the color of their skin or the religion that they believe in or the country that they're from? Or why do we hate it? Why do we hate it when guilty people are decreed to be innocent by unjust judges? Is it just that your ethic and someone else's ethic don't quite match up in that moment? Is it just that your conception of justice and somebody else's conception of justice aren't on the same page? Or is it something much, much deeper than that? You see, there is an unescapable conception of justice that is undeniably present across all cultures throughout history in the heart of humanity, which constrains us from actually wholeheartedly engaging and engaging with and living in a world that has no fixed points of ethics or justice. See, Dawkins proposes a world of blind, pitiless indifference, and that simply is not the world which we expect to be in. It's not the world which we hope to be in, and it's not the world in which we actually live. We don't act as if that is true. The once atheist turned Christian C.S. Lewis put it this way. My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? 
What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? Of course, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying that it was nothing but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. For the argument depended on saying that the world was really unjust, not simply that it did not happen to please my private fancies. Consequently, atheism turns out to be too simple. You tracking? So if we can't honestly run away from God because of injustice, if we can't honestly deny him, abandon him, because there's injustice in the world, because without him there is no standard for justice at all, then what are we supposed to do with God? How are we supposed to relate to him? How are we supposed to understand this God who is supposedly just in a world that is unjust? I'd like to offer up three things that are true about the God of the Bible and how he relates to justice. The first is this. God is good. Have you ever wanted to be able to just sit down, sit down at a table across from God and have a conversation with him face to face? Ask him to explain the things that you you don't understand, but also maybe even ask him to explain himself for the things that you can't understand. This is the situation that a man named Moses found himself in. He was on top of a mountain, Mount Sinai, and God came down from the heavens, descended in a cloud, and stood next to Moses and had a conversation with him. And as God arrived... As the clouds descended on the mountain and the presence of the Lord sat down across from the table, so to speak, with Moses, God announces himself. He self-discloses about who he is, what he is like, and this is what he says. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, that's, me, that's God's name, a God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. This self-disclosure, this divine self-revelation of God, it is key to the story of the Bible. Um, It is repeated over 20 times uh, in whole and in part across the Old and the New Testament as God's people have to remind themselves what their God is like and as God has to remind his people when they forget what he is like. This is the statement that God's people and God himself come back to. And God's goodness is wrapped up in this statement See, God's goodness means that he is merciful. He brings relief and help to the needy. God's goodness is wrapped up in his graciousness, that he passionately loves and serves people who do not deserve him and who do not deserve his love and his help. It means that God is slow to anger, that he patiently walks with us humans as we make mistakes again and again. And again and again and again and again and again, that he does not quickly become angry with us. It means that God is abounding in faithfulness, that he is devoted to his people no matter what. He is forgiving, passing over our inevitable sins of both wrong actions done and right actions left undone. And God's goodness means that he is just. He will by no means clear the guilty. And this is a good thing because it means that God keeps order as a just judge who decrees fair punishment on those who bring disorder, pain, and suffering upon others and against God. You see, the God of the Bible not only does what is good, but he himself is good. He is the definition for what good is. 
So if God is good, that means he is the standard by which all good things are measured. So if there's anything good in the world, it's good because it's like God. And if there's anything good in the world, it's good because it actually comes from God. Fifty years ago, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. With his life and in his death, he gave himself up for the sake of justice. He gave himself up to make things right for the black Americans who have been oppressed, disadvantaged, and devalued in our country for so, so long. And in April of 1963, Dr. King joined with the grassroots civil rights campaign in Birmingham, Alabama, with a series of public marches and sit-ins to protest and speak out against a systematic racism and segregationist policy that had been enacted in Birmingham. Quite poetically and very symbolically, Dr. King was arrested on Good Friday. On the day that we remember the unjust arrest and treatment of Jesus Christ, that was the same day that Dr. King was roughly arrested and improperly treated in Birmingham. And the next day, a newspaper was smuggled in to Dr. King. And in it was a statement from eight white Alabaman pastors decrying and rebuking Dr. King of his pursuit of justice and his methods to achieve it. As Dr. King read this statement, he began to write a response in the margins of that smuggled in newspaper. And what he began to write there became this iconic document of the civil rights movement called The Letter from Birmingham Jail. If you have not read it, please, right now, pull out a pen or your phone and give yourself a reminder, read that this afternoon. It is incredible, and you ought to read it. You see, in, in, Bir in the letter from Birmingham Jail, Dr. King provides a defense of his pursuit of justice and his methods by which he's seeking to bring about justice and to make things right. And he roots his pursuit of justice, what had been called in the statements in the newspaper, extremism. Dr. King says, yes, I'm an extremist because I love the God who is the extremist for love, truth, and goodness. This icon of the American civil rights movement loved what was good, truth and justice and love because he loved the God who is good. We see this in letter from Birmingham jail when Dr. King explains his love of justice by showing us God's love of justice. In the book of Amos, when God spoke these words, but let Justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. See, God is good. He delights in what is right and beautiful and true and just, and He hates what is wrong and destructive and false and unjust. The second truth we see about the God of the Bible and how he relates to justice is that God is powerful. Have you ever heard a story on the news or heard a story on the radio about something horrible happening in the world, about an injustice, and that your heart just felt pulled? I, I need to do something about that. I need to look that up. I need to be a part of helping make that thing right. Or have you ever been on social media and saw a social justice campaign being shared and just felt moved to say, I can do so, I, sh I should do something about that. Like, I'll sign the petition, I'll donate some of my money, I'll volunteer some time. I just want to be a part of making this wrong thing right. And if you're like me, so often that feeling of desiring to help be a part of justice, to help make things right, is accompanied with another feeling. Or although I want to help, I actually feel helpless to actually affect any real change. Like the problem is so big. The problem is so deep. How can I 
change that? How can I make that different? How can I bring right out of wrong? I'm just me. We often feel powerless to do anything about injustice. God has never felt that. God has never been powerless or helpless or incapable. The absolute ability and supreme power of God sets him apart from us humans and from all other lowercase g gods. There was a time when the people of God in the Old Testament were walking away from God. Not towards atheism like we see in our culture and our society today, but towards other gods. And the Lord sent a reminder to his people of who he was, how good he was as their God through the prophet Isaiah saying this, To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be alike? For I am God. And there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times things not yet done. Saying my counsel shall stand. And I will accomplish all my purpose. See God is unparalleled because he is uniquely able and in charge. So often when we speak of good and evil We speak of them as if they are two equal but opposite forces, forever locked in battle to win the universe. This is what we see in books and in the the shows and in the movies that we watch. This is what happens in the plays that we watch at the theater is that there is good and evil, right and wrong, the light side and the dark side, the hero and the villain and their peers. They're equal. They're almost seemingly forever engaged in this battle where one will take ground and the other will take ground and it's uncertain as to who will win and to what will happen. The Bible tells a very different tale about good and evil. We see here that God is good and evil is not his equal. There is none like God He does not wonder how this is all going to turn out. He does not wonder if he is going to win or if he is going to be victorious because he has planned and purposed for good to win, for him to win. And there's no one and there's nothing that can stop him. God is powerful. So, if God is good... And if God is powerful, why is there injustice? If God loves and desires what is right, and he has the ability to do all that he pleases, why is there injustice? And this question matters. And it matters that you and I engage with this question honestly giving ourselves permission to bring out our emotions. Because, man, this is a loaded, loaded question. This brings up those emotions and those feelings and those memories that you you would rather keep hidden away because they're too much to handle. It brings up anger and fear and pain and frustration. May I implore you, do not stuff those down inside of you. Do not keep those hidden in a deep, dark corner of your heart where they can just sit and fester. God does not ask you to do that. God does not ask you to keep your emotions hidden away, and I won't ask you to do that either. So would you bring them out into the open right now? Would you let what you're feeling come out into the open air so that it can mix and engage with the people that you love and trust? And so even this morning that it could mix and engage with God. This question matters so much. And our emotional response matters so much to God that he devoted an entire book of the Bible to it. Uh, There's a story there about loss and death and confusion. 
a story about sickness and anger and relationship. It is a story about justice called Job. Would you imagine with me for a minute? Would you all close your eyes? And I want you to imagine with me the worst day you could possibly have. What would happen in that day? What things would you lose? And what people would you lose? And what pain would you suffer? There once was a man named Job who had a day like the one you're imagining. It started with messenger after messenger after messenger coming to tell him that he had lost it all. His business, his savings, his investments, and even all of his employees had either been stolen, killed, or destroyed by thieves and supernatural disaster. And that was enough to leave Job's head spinning. That was enough to bring Job to his knees. That was enough to engage Job's defense mechanism so that he could put up walls to keep out the grief over what had just happened. But in that moment, as he received that news, pain pierced through all of his defenses as the worst news he could have possibly imagined came to him. All ten of Job's children. They had been together in a house having a party. And the house collapsed on them, killing them all. And he was going to have to bury his ten babies. His children that he had raised up, that he had loved, that he had seen mature and grow up. They weren't going to bury him. He was going to have to bury them. And as Job mourned and grieved, even his own health vanished. It was taken away from him. And he was afflicted with painful, debilitating sores and boils on every square inch of his skin. Job's life on that day was absolutely, utterly broken. And so Job struggled to understand what we struggle to understand How could a good and powerful God let this be? How could a good and powerful God let his children die in their prime, force a father to bury his kids? How could a good and powerful God let thieves steal all of his possessions and let murderers kill his employees? See, Job was face to face with the question we've asked the past three weeks now. Who needs God? If this can happen, who needs him? And in this faith-shaking moment, even Job's own wife told him, Job, let go of your integrity. Curse God and die. Job's response is both remarkable and deeply unsettling. He said, shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive evil? Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? Job believed that God had something to do with his suffering. He did not believe that God didn't care or that God couldn't have stopped it. He believed that on the worst day of his life, God was there and he was still good and still in control. Unless we too quickly dismiss Job's understanding of God here as misplaced blame given in an impossible situation, the narrator of the book of Job immediately follows up these words with this comment. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. What did Job know that we don't? In light of the great evil and injustice that he suffered, why didn't he abandon the God who claims to be good and powerful yet had given Job such great disaster? Job knew this third truth about who God is and how he relates to justice. God is wise. God is 
wise. Now, as Job continued to grieve and to work through all of his mess, he did begin to doubt. And he accused God of injustice. And he challenged God to come and hear his case against him. And he demanded that God come in person and answer him for what he had done. And with all of his anger and his hurt and his confusion, Job screamed out a single word question for God to answer. Why? God, why? And as Job was on his knees, yelling out to the heavens, dark clouds appeared on the horizon and a great storm descended upon him. And out of the whirlwind of the storm, God spoke, beginning with these words, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? God proceeds to answer Job's question of why with a flurry of his own questions, asking Job to explain the intricacies of how the universe works and functions, asking Job to explain how he would tame two of the greatest and most fearsome beasts that God had ever created upon the face of the earth. In short, this was God's answer to Job's question, why? I know best. I do not like that. I, I don't enjoy that answer. Like that's not like a soothing balm to my heart that just makes me feel the warm and fuzzies and it resolves all the issues. Like it, it doesn't. And if it doesn't for you, like, hey, we're in good company. This answer requires me to admit that I am not on the same level as God and I'm not even the same type of being as God. I cannot address God as if I were above him, speaking down to him and handing down my judgment to him. I can't even relate to God as a peer or an equal. I can't stand next to him and exchange critical feedback of how we think about each other and what we're doing. See, this answer places God squarely above me. It places God above us in substance, in role, and in ability. That God is greater. Again, God spoke to his people, Israel, through the prophet Isaiah, clearly stating the difference between us and him, saying these words, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Part of the reason that I don't like God's answer here, that it's so hard to accept God's wisdom as his answer to the question why, is that that answer includes information that I do not know and that I cannot access. God's answer that he is wise, it assumes that somehow in some way his goodness and his power are maintained even in the midst of horrible injustice even though I can't see it, even though I can't understand it, even though I cannot even access the information to explain why it is so. Tim Keller puts it this way, if we knew what God knows we would ask exactly for what he gives. What? If we knew what God knows, we would ask exactly for what he gives? Come on, Tim. What is this? When I think about awful stories of injustice, like the ones we began with, Elena, her ability to produce children stolen from her, Andre, his family killed, and his entire, like, his entire people group mistreated and murdered, Think about Chicha. Her granddaughter is being raised by the people that are behind that girl's parents being killed. How is, how is this true in that situation? How is this true in our situation? I don't know. 
I do not know how this is true. I cannot explain to you the mechanics and the reasoning behind it. And in the end, it comes down to this one question. Do you trust God? Do you trust God? Can you fill the gap between our ability to understand and to be wise and God's ability to know what is best with trust? And you see, this is important because justice, what we've been talking about, this spark that ignites the abandonment of God. Justice is not a philosophical issue. Justice is a relational issue. And surely justice is about the relationship between us as humans. It is about how when we get together on this world, we mess it up. We create awful, wrong, evil things and mistreat each other horribly. Injustice is about making those wrong things right. But primarily, justice is about making things right between us and God because that relationship is severely broken because of what we've done. And so, injustice ought not cause us to run away from God, denying Him, hating Him. But instead, somehow, inexplicably, injustice ought to cause us to run towards God. Because we know ourselves. Because we know that I am not perfectly good. I don't always desire what is right. I'm not perfectly powerful. I can't do all the things that I want to do. And I'm not perfectly wise. I don't get it all, and I don't always see what's best. And that's true for all of us. And if God really is good and powerful and wise, when I encounter injustice, I ought not run away but towards him because he's the only one that can bring justice about. He's the only one that can right what is wrong. It is one thing to be able to believe, to sign off, on a piece of paper that you agree to these statements, God is good, God is powerful, God is wise. That's one thing. It's not a bad thing. But it is quite another thing to know, to have a relationship with, and to trust the God who is good, who is powerful, and who is wise. Some of us, we do relationally know the God of the Bible, and More or less, we trust him, but man, it's hard. There's areas of our lives that we do not want to give over to him and to entrust to him. Some of us, we do not know the God of the Bible in terms of a relationship, and man, we definitely do not trust him with anything. Some of us used to know him. Back in the day, we knew the God of the Bible, and we trusted him with something, and it seemed like he totally messed it up, and we wonder, could I ever trust him again? Wherever you are at, I invite you to consider again, to consider afresh and anew that God is worthy of your trust, that he is good, he is powerful, he is wise, and he's worthy of you believing on him and trusting in him. And like any relationship, the only way that you can know you can trust someone is to actually know them. Next week, as we come back, we're going to explore this issue. How do we know God? How do we know who he is, what he is like? If that's something you're interested in learning about and growing in, please come back. And if there's people in your life that you think would benefit from learning how to know God, bring them along with you. This is a journey. This is a process. It is not easy or comfortable, and that is 100% okay. Let's pray. God, sometimes I find it easy to trust you and sometimes I find it nearly impossible. I know that's not my story. That is probably all of our story. And so I just ask that you would continue to meet with us. You've been with us throughout this whole morning and you will continue to go with us today as we go back to our homes and to our families, to our communities and neighborhoods. And I ask God, would you be whispering in our ear today? Would you be pulling on our heart today, moving us to know you more and to trust you? Ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.